Right then guys, it's PSL here and I'm here for part 8 in my series on Grand Prix Manager 2, Managing Jordan. And it's been a little bit of a while, hasn't it? I mean, it's been over a month since I recorded one of these videos and probably quite a while since you last saw one of these. I mean, to be fair, it wasn't too long ago when I put up the montage for the 1996 season, which if you haven't watched, I would definitely recommend because... Even though I've recorded, edited and watched all of these videos, well I mean I forgot that Hightower Frenson won the Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. And not only that, Johnny Herbert nearly got a podium, I mean it was nearly a double podium for Sauber until Johnny Herbert retired, I mean that was, that was kind of the start of Johnny Herbert's bad luck. But anyway, you know if you haven't seen that video be sure to check that out. Um, but yes, this is the first brand new part in quite a while where we'll be starting the 1997 season. And quite honestly, I got a lot of hope for this season. I mean, we came second in the Constructors last time, Brundle came second in the Drivers' Championship, and we got better people on board, a much better engine up from Peugeot to Renault, and quite honestly, we came so close to winning in 1996, how can we not win in 1997? But either way, just a quick recap, of course, Martin Brundle came second in the Drivers' Championship last season, one point ahead of Gerhard Berger, and then Barrichello came seventh in the Drivers' Championship, just behind Jacques Villeneuve. That's a slight concern, because, well, I mean, if you look at the drivers, Brundle, who came second, we don't have anymore, and Barrichello, who came seventh, we do have. So, you know, maybe a bit of a mistake in hindsight, but, you know... We're giving Barrichello a second attempt to prove himself. Olivier Panis, classic driver, more a classic in the real life 1996 season than he was in this career mode. But I mean, having said that, Panis, a pretty solid driver. He scored 10 of Ligier's 11 points last season. So one thing it's safe to say is that he's much better than Pedro Diniz. Now, of course, we got to sort out the test driver. Well, I mean, this is where this this situation got quite annoying, didn't it? Because, um, because of course, of the whole Ralph Schumacher situation, that kind of glitchy issue that happened there, which I can sign him, but... Mm. Montoya was suggested, but, I mean, I don't actually think Ralph Schumacher's driving stats are particularly great in this game, and if his are bad, Montoya's are really not going to be great either. So... So yeah, Montoya was suggested in the comments, because of course I did ask for your comments. And then, so we go to the experience pool. Jean Lacy, I don't think, was particularly well mentioned in the comments. Unsurprising, really, because I can't guarantee that I'll be able to afford his salary. Especially not with Barrichello and Panis as well. So, we're going to get the legend himself, Take Inoue, as our test driver. I mean, look, 8 million, 8 million is the amount of money he's offering. He only offered 3 million last season. That's how desperate he is to get into Formula 1. Let's try 9 million. We know he has 8 million, but you might be able to squeeze more out of him. No, oh, okay, he's attacking you. He doesn't have that amount of a sponsorship. Does he have... Just try standard 8 million then. There you go, attacking you. He's got 8 million to give us, and... There you go, look at those stats, they are abysmal. But having said that, MO, I think that's morale or motivation. He is motivated, and that is what I like to see, because quite honestly, we're not giving him a race car any anytime soon. Unless Panis or Barrichello fall ill, but that's unlikely. So that's all good, so we've got the test driver sorted, Take and Yue. So Barrichello, pretty solid driver, glad we've got him on the team. Panis, by far and away the best driver for Ligier last season. And look at his stats, he's certainly good. And Taki and UA is going to make us rich. So, what's there not to like about this driver lineup? And next season, I will try and get some better drivers. Actually, that is a good point. I would like you guys to comment in the, you know, in the comment section any drivers I should get for the next season. But the problem is, unlike with F4 Manager, it, it's not as simple as just picking a driver and signing them because you can sign drivers for multiple seasons which is what some teams have done which I'll get into actually in just a second but just before I get into the driver lineups something which is just as interesting the engine contracts have been signed 
And by and large, it's not very interesting. Of course, we've got Renault engines, the same as Benetton. That's not really that interesting. I mean, Williams, 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 Williams. Look at them with their Ford ZTEC engines. Th this does sound worse than it is. I mean, they got the same engines as Sauber, and Sauber had these engines last year, so it's not a downgrade. It's not as big of a downgrade as you would expect. I mean, they, they've got the same engines as Sauber, and Sauber's a pretty strong team. But if you look at the numbers, 680 horsepower, 130 kilograms, the Renault engines they had last season and the ones we've got, they've got 20 more horsepower, sure they weigh 5 kilograms more, but they're higher quality, the best fuel supplier is designed with this engine in mind, it's just much better, but as I said, Williams, they've got the same engines as Sauber, so it's not that big of a downgrade, um, but still, I mean, Williams last season... Pretty abysmal until the end. They finished 13 points behind Benetton, and that's the team they were really most comparable to. 13 points behind, honestly, right now, with this engine disadvantage they've got to Benetton, they could be miles back, way more than 13 points. But if you look at this, I mean, so they've got a Ford engine, 680 horsepower. Other teams that have Ford engines, I don't think Ligier does. No, okay. Minardi does though, Minardi has a Ford engine, in fact the HB, that's a Ford engine as well which no one's got, that's got 670 horsepower, so 10 less than the one Williams and Sauber have got, Minardi they've got 675 horsepower and the same weight, so actually Minardi's engine is very close in specification to that of Sauber and Williams, and then Pacific they've got an engine which has got 640 horsepower so Pacific the brand new team for this season they've got a dreadful engine and then there's 40 even 40's engine has got 10 more horsepower than Pacific's and is a star and a half better in quality and I think that's everything on the engine front so that's good so let's get into the team's lineup I'm gonna try and dash through this really quickly but look at the team we're fielding this season. Adrian Newey, Pat Simmons, Carl Gaydon and Jim Wright. All of those people from Williams apart from Pat Simmons who is from Benetton. So mostly Williams. I think this is why Williams was so poor last season because all of these guys, well you know, three of them were contracted to Jordan and so they just didn't feel as motivated. I think because I know staff morale is something which is genuinely important in this game and I think because we poached those guys right at the start of the season, it ruined morale and I think that was what completely destroyed Williams from the inside and I think that's why Benetton were better because we only took one of their guys compared to three from Williams and then driver lineup and engines, we all know all about that. And then we got Williams. Now Williams, we know their engine situation isn't too great. I mean they have only got the fifth best engine on the grid but look at their personnel. It's unbeatable. Rory Byrne from Benetton gone to Williams. Tim Preston, the only head of a department we didn't take from Williams, he's still there. And then the other two guys are from Benetton. So it's a Benetton Williams hybrid, much like what we got actually. So basically, on a personnel front, Williams and Jordan were basically equally matched. And then, I mean, look at the drivers. I mean, we've got Barrichello, Panison, and UA. I mean, that's a mediocre driver lineup. Williams, they've got Damon Hill still, Jean Christophe Boulion as a test driver, although he's serving no purpose because, you know, he's French but they haven't got Renault engines. But Williams' driver number one this season is Michael Schumacher. I mean, Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill, teammates on the same team at Williams. That's unbeatable. And not only is it unbeatable, that is going to be an explosive teammate rivalry. Next up it's Ferrari and Ferrari are looking pretty much exactly the same as they did last season so I'm expecting them to be right up there you know podiums maybe the odd race win. I mean the only difference really is Tim Holloway who was at Jordan so I mean we saw him last season as our chief engineer he was good there's no denying that and he's gone to Ferrari so you know not a bad replacement there and then the driver lineup they've still got Irvine they've still got Larini but they have replaced Michael Schumacher with Uko Katayama. Now that's a bold move, that is a really bold move. I mean, he didn't 
start every race last season, he didn't score any points. Sure, he was in a Tyrrell, but Ferrari are so confident about his abilities, they've signed Katayama for two seasons. McLaren is a mishmash of pretty much every team up and down the grid. Gary Anderson's from Jordan originally, Lynetto's from Ferrari, Dassoud is from Ligier, and Norman Howe is still from McLaren. So, it really is a mishmash in terms of the personnel front. And then the drivers, I have to say, one of the best driver lineups on the grid. Still got Jan Magnussen, still got David Coulthard, but Mika Hakkinen has been replaced by Jacques Villeneuve. And all of those guys, they're all there for two seasons. So, that is a pretty consistent stable, and I'd have to say, at least on paper, very good personnel lineup, both in terms of the backroom staff and the drivers. And then Ligier, good old Ligier, one of my favourite teams actually on the grid. And there's not really too much to say here. Ernst Keller is originally from Sauber. Noel Stanbury is from Tyrrell. So all of those Tyrrell staff which were unfortunately out of a job when Tyrrell went bankrupt. Well some of them are actually keeping their jobs or finding new employment because Noel Stanbury, he's found a job at Ligier. So that's good. And then the driver lineup, I mean, they've still got Pedro Diniz, Kelvin Burtz, driver number two, Vincenzo Sospiri. It's a pretty standard driver lineup, not too much change, nothing particularly interesting there. It's just, you know, a standard Ligier team, really. And to be fair, that is a statement that can be said for a lot of teams up and down the grid, although less so really for Benetton. And that's because, thanks to us at Jordan and Williams, all of the heads of their various different departments have all changed. I mean, Neil Oatley's from McLaren, Gundel is also from McLaren, Jim Vale is from Jordan, and Chris Williams is from Ligier. So, lots of change there. Their engines are still the same. Gerhard Berger is still there, but their second driver is Mika Hakkinen. Once again, another solid driver lineup. I think that is something a lot of the top teams have done. They have all gotten very good driver lineups, apart from Ferrari. I mean, Benetton, Berger and Hakkinen, that is a brilliant driver lineup. Then Sauber, not a great deal to say initially. Their chief designer and chief engineer were both there last season. And then their chief mechanic and commercial manager have both been taken from Arrows. They've got the same engines. But the driver situation, that's where it gets very interesting. I'm not at all surprised that another team signed Martin Brundle. I mean, he nearly won the driver's championship. He came second. He beat Gerhard Berger. So, Sauber have taken the plunge to get Martin Brundle and partner him alongside the fellow Brit, Johnny Herbert. But, my, I mean, Martin Brundle's there for two seasons. They've got a lot of confidence in him. Less so for Johnny Herbert, but strangely, they've got more confidence in Herbert than they have in Frenson because despite the fact that Johnny Herbert was the driver who constantly got replaced last season by Norberto Fontana, Herbert's the one who's got the race seat Heinz Aud Frensen, who let's not forget, won a Grand Prix for Sauber last season. He won the Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, and he scored every single point for Sauber last season. Fontana and Herbert, both of them never scored points, but Heinz Aud Frensen scored 14 for Sauber. Yet, Frensen is the test driver, Johnny Herbert's the driver number two. I mean, they can swap all of that around. Herbert could soon become the test driver, so could Brundle. You know, it's quite fluid. But as it stands, Herbert's the, Herbert's the driver number two, and Frenson's the test driver, which makes no sense whatsoever. And then on to Arrows. Again, their chief designer and chief engineer have been kept from the previous season, but as we saw, Sauber took their chief mechanic and commercial manager. So they've got Nigel Steer, who was at Tyrrell last season. So once again, it's good to find yet another Tyrrell employee who has found new employment at another team. But then there's Mark Gallagher. Now here's where it gets interesting and also a little bit tragic. Because Mark Gallagher, he's from Formula 3000. So in the designer, engineer, mechanic and commercial manager areas, there's obviously all the people who are in Formula 1. But then there's a large group of people who aren't in Formula 1. And generally these people aren't very good. The one thing I can say about Mark Gallagher is he is the very best commercial manager not in Formula 1 at the start of 1996 and his rating, he's two stars, he's got a two star rating which is the same as 40's original commercial manager so 
hopefully arrows don't go bankrupt it's just a commercial manager is not what i'd want to skimp money out on maybe a mechanic or an engineer but not a commercial manager because you need to sure you, you need to spend money to make money and getting someone who's not very good at bringing in money is just a surefire way to bankruptcy really but then the driver market all the drivers that they've got they've got Jos Verstappen, Kenny Brack and Emmanuel Collard but yet Kenny Brack is a driver number two for three seasons then he's due to be demoted to the test driver after those three seasons so Kenny Brack is contracted to Arrows for five seasons and then there's Emmanuel Collard, Tyrrell's former test driver who was brilliant I mean Tyrrell was just brilliant on occasion but Emmanuel Collard qualified right up there I think he qualified fifth at one Grand Prix he certainly had pace but unfortunately has only been made the test driver but you know maybe he'll get into a race seat once again I mean Kenny Brack they Arrows have already got plans to make Kenny Brack the test driver so they might do that prematurely and anyway on to Minardi there's not really much to say here everybody has been retained from the last season apart from Ian Phillips who was our former commercial manager. Now we saw Ian Phillips, he was attracting four star sponsors. He, you know, he was a good commercial manager. Of course, Minardi, who knows? They could rack up some money and they could be right up there in a few seasons time. I doubt it, but I, I'd be really surprised if they ended up bankrupt. And then drivers, they've still got Fizzy Keller, still got Pedro Lamy, but then they've got Norberto Fontana. Now we saw he was good for Sauber, I mean, you know, he did a few races for Sauber, he was arguably better than Johnny Herbert, even on occasion better than Heinz Held Frentzen. So Fontana is certainly a good driver, hence why Minardi have got him. I think Fontana deserves a better seat than at Minardi, but it's good to see he's got a race seat, unlike Emmanuel Collard. So that's Minardi. Second to last team now, good old 40. Much like their slightly more successful compatriot team, Minardi, they got a very similar mindset. I mean, Ricardo Di Marco, he's been retained from the previous season, but then there's their chief engineer, Peter Ellingham. He is someone who was also in Formula 3000 last season, so a guy who's lacking Formula 1 experience. But, to be fair to Peter Ellingham, he is a two-star engineer, and 40's chief engineer last season was also a two-star engineer, so they haven't actually downgraded, they've just got someone with less experience. Their chief mechanic, Jerry Bond, he's also from Formula 3000. But as I said, much like with Minardi, they recognise that a commercial manager is vital, hence why they've got another decent one, Fritz Kaiser, who was at Sauber last season. And then I'm pretty certain there's been next to no change in their driver lineup. Montemini's been retained, so has Padoa, and then there's Frank... Lagarush, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but I think he was there last season, certainly Montemini and Padoa were, so basically 40 are looking pretty much exactly the same, but just with a slightly better commercial manager, that's essentially it. And then there's the new team, Pacific. Now this is almost a weird case of history repeating itself, because we know in the real life 1997 season, we had... The Lola team who came in were massively unprepared and then left. Well, I think Pacific are going to do the same thing. Their chief engineer, Frank Kopuk, he was in Formula 3000 last season. He is a two-star chief designer, so similar to 40's chief designer, but still, you know, uninspiring. Peter Weston, he was also in Formula 3000, but he's only a one-and-a-half-star chief engineer, so even worse. And then their chief mechanic and commercial manager are both Formula 3000 people who are half a star rated. Their drivers are pretty uninspiring as well, Bertrand Gasho for three seasons, Mark Goosens, who now I think of it, I think Mark Goosens might have been driving for either Forti or Minardi last season, I think he might have been one of their test drivers, so that's the sort of calibre of driver we're talking about. And then there's Oliver Gavin for three seasons, so Pacific are looking dreadful to sum it up So there you go. I mean, that's the season those are the teams So hopefully that might have been a little bit long But hopefully you get the idea of where every team is heading into this season Now just before I head into the first race of the season which weirdly is in Jerez I mean we saw in the last episode that the FIA voted in favor 
of getting rid of the Australian Grand Prix at Melbourne and replacing it with the Spanish, I get it was either the second Spanish Grand Prix or the second European Grand Prix, either way, um, at Jerez, I'm obviously going to do all of the pre-season stuff such as pre-season testing, I'll probably do 300 laps around Silverstone and re-signing sponsors now that Shell and Cannon have finally left us the cheap skates. Um, yeah, just before I head into the first race of the season, I'll do all of that. Just before we head into the Grand Prix, of course I'm doing some pre-season testing and before the season starts, you can actually test anywhere. So I thought I'd test at Jerez. One thing I realised is I've looked at every single setup I've got in this game and none of them are for Jerez. So I'm using an Estoril setup because it's probably the closest I'm going to get. But either way, it doesn't matter. Look at the times. I mean, Barrichello's best time at 26.8. Panis, a couple of temps off. So slightly slower, but that I was kind of expecting that. So Barrichello on the 26.8. Panis on a 27 dead, Take and Yue's best time was a 29.5. So he's over two and a half seconds slower than Barrichello. Like, what's even the point of having him, apart from his money, of course? Well, here we are coming towards the end of the practice session at the Spanish Grand Prix in Jerez. And, of course, this is only practice, but, I mean, the confidence I had heading into this Grand Prix has been shattered. 14th and 15th. As I said, I don't have a setup for her ref and this is only practice, but 14th and 15th. I mean, our drivers are very equally matched. That's a positive, and that's about the only positive I can take. We were beaten by Jos Verstappen in the arrows. Uh, David Coulthard's the quickest, but Villeneuve's down in 12th. Michael Schumacher's in 3rd, but Damon Hill's in 9th. Katayama beat Eddie Irvine. I mean, Katayama in the Ferrari's in 5th. Pedro Diniz in the Ligier is in second. So actually, actually overall, Ligier are beating Williams. Yes, because Diniz is ahead of Schumacher and Burt is ahead of Damon Hill. Qualifying has always been our knack. Race pace, we were okay, about the same as Ligier and Sauber. Qualifying was what did it for us. So Barrichello coming round the last corner, oh no, he's coming up towards the last corner. There we go, Barrichello coming round the last corner. Where will he qualify? Who knows? And what about Panis? Again, who knows? I haven't actually seen any message for a qualifying lap record being broken, which is weird considering there is no qualifying lap record around this track. But where are we? Back in our usual position, Barrichello has taken pole position around her ref, Panis only two tenths behind, and they're ahead of Eddie Irvine, who strangely is in third. And then Katayama's in seventh. And again, this is all at the moment. I mean, we're coming towards the end of the session. 40 have been able to get into the 1 minute 20s, just about. And then Pacific, well, we'll just have to wait and see. So here are the final qualifying times. Barrichello from Panis, from Irvine, who's done remarkably well to finish in third. And then it's Berger and Hakkinen. So, Gerhard Berger's beaten Mecca Hakkinen, that's not too much of a surprise, although the margin is less than a tenth. So Hakkinen, I think, will be giving Berger a run for his money this season. David Coulthard in sixth, Katayama seventh. I mean, Coulthard has beaten Villeneuve again in a session, but I think Villeneuve's just getting used to the McLaren car, possibly. Williams down in tenth and eleventh, Damon Hill has actually outqualified Michael Schumacher. But of course, I mean, the main team we can compare Williams to is Sauber. And they've beaten Sauber comprehensively. I mean, Brundle's in 13th, Johnny Herbert's in 14th. So, Brundle stamping his authority over Johnny Herbert. He was quicker in practice and now in qualifying. And then, Fizzy Keller beat Fontana, actually. So, actually, Fontana was much slower in qualifying than he was in practice for some reason. And then we got 40, who were the joke team. In the previous season, well, they're not the joke team now in 1997 because Pacific, they still cannot break into the 1 minute 20s. A 1 minute 30.8 for Bertrand Gasho and then a 1 minute 30.9 for Mark Goosens means that they're not even coming close to taking part in the Grand Prix. Right then, so here we are on the race strategy screen and as always, it's a two-stop strategy for this Grand Prix with Panis coming in a lap later than Barrichello 
for the first Spanish Grand Prix around Jerez this series. And we qualified first and second, that's pretty good, but look at this, the minimum car weight. I mean, our car weight is 666 kilograms, the minimum weight is 575. We're nearly 100 kilograms over the minimum weight. Because, of course, as we saw at the, at the end of last season, the minimum car weight for this season has been reduced. I think last year it was 600 kilograms. It might even have been more than that, but I think it was 600 kilograms, which was fine. But now it's 575, and generally, if you're over 100 kilograms over the minimum car weight, you've had it, essentially. So we're running dangerously close to that. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. We've got a quick car. We've got some quick drivers. Renault engines aren't too heavy. You can certainly get worse than that. So importantly, is anyone going to stall on this formation lap? Let's find out. No, no one has actually. So, that means the 1997 Spanish Grand Prix around Jerez, the first race of the 1997 season, is underway. No one has stalled, and it looks like Eddie Irvine, he's coming under threat from both Benetton's, but crucially, Barrichello has been able to retain the lead. Panis is still in second, Irvine still in third. And I think we've still got David Coulthard holding on to the last points place in that McLaren. So let's find... The, yeah, the TV camera it's due to be an all-dry Grand Prix here at Jerez. And, yeah, new lap records being set by our drivers. That was Gerhard Berger's trait last season, always setting lap records. Damon Hill's pitted already. I don't know if he's... Look at, look at the lap records flying in. Oko Katayama briefly set a lap record. So is Pedro Diniz. Look at all of these people setting lap records. Michael Schumacher and the Williams now, he's having a go at it. But of course, with the fuel loads going down, it's, you know, lap records are always going to be beaten. Uh, wow. But anyway, yeah, Damon Hill down in 16th. He did have a 10-second penalty. So, Damon Hill down 16th, setting the fastest lap. Well, no, well, yeah, the fastest lap, but also the, um, the new race lap record. But 10 laps in, and things are looking pretty good for us at the moment. Oh no, David Coulthard has just entered the pits. He's now down in 7th, just behind Michael Schumacher. Right, okay, so fuel in the tank. I forgot to change the pit stop lap. I forgot about that. It doesn't matter. We've overfueled the car for that first stint, but you know, we can spend less time refueling here. So that's fine. We need 20, 23 laps worth of fuel. That's all good. New tyres. Bang, 10.6 seconds in the pits, of course, with our new chief mechanic, we should be having quicker pit stops, in theory anyway. Lots of people coming in, Schumacher, Katayama, they're all in the pits at the same time. Panis, I think, is one of the last guys out there, or certainly the last of the front runners, to be pitting in. 11.2 seconds now for Olivier Panis, and... Oh... That was quite terrifying, it said he was in 13th, he's in 4th, I think he's been jumped by... David Coulthard, and, strangely, Pedro Diniz and the Ligier. I mean, Ligier are looking reasonably good this season. Um, okay. Oh. Oh. Panis, yeah, he's holding up quite a train. Okay, but either way, um, Barrichello is holding up a train with David Coulthard and Pedro Diniz. Panis was slower, I think, before... Everyone entered the pits. I think Panis was about five seconds behind Barrichello. So Barrichello is definitely the quicker Jordan driver. But um, Panis is in fourth. And it goes all the way down to Johnny Herbert in 13th. So that's a 10-car train that Olivier Panis is holding up. Oh, we've got our first no second retirements of the 1997 season. I was about to say, Jos Verstappen's retired. But Martin Brundle, he's got... The bad luck that Johnny Herbert had, where well, it seems to be the case anyway. Hacking and setting lap records. Um, Panis is back up into second. I don't know if Coulthard pitted, I assume he did. Panis is 26 seconds behind Barrichello. So I guess that means Barrichello, unless he retires, can't lose the race lead, because even Barrichello, no, even Panis won't pass Barrichello. So we need 23 more laps of fuel to go to the end. For Barrichello, 12.1 seconds. 11.2 seconds. So Panis, 
He was in second briefly, he now appears to be in seventh. And Barrichello, don't tell me Barrichello's retired. Whoo, that was scary. It just, because it just had Barrichello and a load of dashes. I thought he retired. No, actually what's happened is Barrichello has been overtaken by David Coulthard. So hang on. Where is Barrichello? That's not him. There's Barrichello. And yeah, Coulthard's are way up. So David Coulthard and that McLaren. I mean, McLaren and Coulthard, they had a pretty anonymous season last season. But look at Coulthard now. Leading the Grand Prix by 15 seconds. Kenny Brack. Something is wrong with Arrows. Their mechanics, their engineers. Gerhard Berger. Gerhard Berger for Benetton has retired. I mean, Benetton, did they actually have a car failure last season? It wouldn't surprise me if they didn't. Benetton's reliability was second to none last season. But yet, Berger's retired. Hakkinen keeps setting the lap record, but um, I think it's Hakkinen's former teammate, David Coulthard, who's going to easily win the Grand Prix. Barrichello's only 17 seconds behind, 19 seconds now, no, Coulthard's pulling away quite a lot at the moment. A fizzy Keller has retired. The team's clearly not used to having to run around her ref, because lots of retirements, we'll find out exactly the reason for all of those retirements later on, but I think... Barrichello is going to take second, Panis in sixth, slightly disappointing, but David Coulthard is a brilliant day for him, a brilliant day for McLaren, as they're going to win the first race in the 1997 season. Katayama for Ferrari, he's retired as well. But either way, you know, bad day for Ferrari, but a good day for Pedro Diniz. Panis has moved up to fifth place thanks to Diniz retiring right at the end. Hey, and Benson and Hedges are sponsoring McLaren now. What's that all about? Okay, either way. I mean, Benson and Hedges, the, the staple Jordan sponsor, are sponsoring, are sponsoring um, McLaren. That's very... I mean, Lee... Uh, Deniz. Deniz, he scored one... Po he, I can't even speak. Deniz scored only one point last season. It looked like he was going to score two or three. He was... I think fifth, maybe even fourth when he retired. That is gutting. But i tell you what, it actually looks like a more balanced season. Johnny Herbert has scored his first points of the series in sixth place. But anyway, back to what I was saying. This season does look a little bit more balanced than the previous season. McLaren are right up there. Benetton are, Sauber, Ligier, Jordan, Ferrari were for a while. It's difficult to say because there were all sorts of strategy all sorts of different strategies going on, but, um, yeah, it does look to be more balanced. A uh, Denise spun off. That is, you're never going to let that down, are you? As a driver, Pedro Denise, a mediocre driver, driving for Ligier, could have scored some crucial points, and they spun off with a lap to go. And same for Katayama. You see, Ferrari, that's why you shouldn't get Katayama, because he spun off with three laps left to go. Irvine didn't do that. Gerhard Berger, that Benetton had an engine failure. It's just typical, isn't it, that the second we have Renault engines and the second that they start having reliability issues. But hey, as long as they affect Benetton and not Jordan, that's a massive positive. Oh yes, Adrian Newey, he's already done something useful for us. He's developed the new advanced steering system. Because, of course, that is the new legalised driving aid by the FIA for this season. And, because, well, I mean, obviously last season the semi-automatic gears were the legal driving aid. We've maxed them out to level 10. Advanced steering, that's newly legalised. We've already got a level 1 system. That could play havoc with the car weight. Let's have a quick look. Um, what am I doing? Driver aids. Uh, how much does that bump up the car weight? That's what I want to find out. Oh, only by 2 kilograms. Brilliant. And, yep, yeah, I hope you guys did enjoy this Grand Prix and this episode. If you did, be sure to leave a like, comment down below, and I'll see you guys next time for the Brazilian Grand Prix. So, actually, a normal Grand Prix in a normal slot in the calendar, which makes a change from the previous Grand Prix. But, yep, yeah, anyway, all that aside, I'll see you guys next time.